And the second, les- the second reading is from Acts 4, verses 23 to 31. And again, you find on page 1096 of your Pew Bibles. The Believer's Prayer. On their release, Peter and John went back to their own people and reported all that the chief priests and elders had said to them. When they heard this, they raised their voices together in prayer to God. Sovereign Lord, they said, you made the heaven and the earth and the sea and everything in them. You spoke by the Holy Spirit through the mouth of your servant, our father David. Why do the nations rage and the peoples plot in vain? The kings of the earth take their stand and the rulers gather together against the Lord and against his anointed one. Indeed, Herod and Pontius Pilate met together with the Gentiles and the people of Israel in this city to conspire against your holy servant Jesus, whom you anointed. They did what your power and will had decided beforehand should happen. Now, Lord, consider their threats and enable your servants to speak your word with great boldness. Stretch out your hand to heal and perform miracles, miraculous signs and wander through the name of your holy servant Jesus. After they prayed, the place where they were meeting was shaken, and they were all filled with the Holy Spirit, and spoke the word of God boldly. This is the word of the Lord. Well, thank you very much indeed for your welcome this morning. Uh, Nigel asked me if I wanted to introduce myself in any way. Uh, I'm not a particularly (laughs) exciting person with a great history, but uh, a couple of things I could mention. One, uh, because it, it came up earlier in the service today. I was one of those 22 million people looking at those very extraordinary <laughs> televisions we used to have in those days to watch the coronation in 1953. And, yes, I went to the neighbor's house because the neighbors um, seemed to be more wealthy than we had. We were, and, and uh, they had a television, which was quite something in those days. So I remember that. Um, On my way sort of through life, um, we spent some time in Manchester, and I mention that because one of our good friends up there was um, uh, Chris Frith, uh, you may know, I don't know if you've ever met him, but John Tis' dad, and uh, and he was a good friend. He wasn't in the same church. We were working in different churches. I was a minister in one church. He was a minister at another church. But we did collaborate on various ventures and projects. And I look back on those times um, with great appreciation for Chris and his family. So it's very good to be here. And uh, we're going to be looking at Acts chapter 4, page 1096. So if you can grab one of those Bibles, I think they're tucked away, some of them, um, just underneath the uh, pew in front. And uh, page 1096, Acts chapter 4. And uh, I'll read bits out of it as we go along. But um, as we have God's words open before us, let's pray together. O God, our Father, we thank you for your word. We thank you that it's available to us. We thank you for the many people over the generations who've made that possible. And we do pray, Lord, that your word may enter into our minds, into our hearts, and into our lives. For Jesus' sake, amen. Now, in this country, we're not known for going to extremes. I think that's fair to say. Our weather is famous for being mild, never too hot and never too cold. But last week, as everybody knows, we topped 40%, uh, 40 degrees. And suddenly we had broken the barrier into what we call extreme weather. Um, Another reason for thinking about extremes is also this summer we've had what we might call extreme cricket and uh, with extreme Bairstow and extreme Stokes and a few other extremes. 
making life very different for us as we've watched what can be very long drawn out and not terribly interesting affairs, a game of cricket. But when we open up the Acts of the Apostles, after quite a quiet, I think I would put it like this, quiet first chapter, we're greeted with an explosion. I can't actually put any less than that, really. An explosion of what we might call extreme Christianity. It's not over extreme. Don't think that. This is genuine Christianity, no doubt about it. But those events that we read about here are quite extraordinary. And if you've been following these over the last few weeks or you just know it from your own Bible reading, um, there were violent winds and shaking floors signaling the arrival of the Holy Spirit. There were daring public sermons inviting a riveted multiracial audience to believe and be baptized in the name of Jesus. And this Jesus, remember, only yesterday, as it were, um, had been executed on a cross by, it felt, on this public demand. Um, he had been executed on a cross and risen. And the impact of everything that was going on was extreme. 3,000 people baptized in one day, with more to follow, I think, when you get to the end of chapter 3 and 4, is that the number had risen to about 5,000. And there was more. There was dramatic miracles. Not just, was that a miracle, that wasn't a miracle? Yes, I mean, everybody could see blatantly something quite conclusive, that somebody who had always been ill, no chance of actually being well, uh, was given a new lease of life and health um, when Peter arrived on the scene. Top apostles were arrested and threatened. And so when you put all that together, and this is all condensed into a few chapters of the Acts of the Apostles, um, it's hardly typical of our relatively calm experience of church life in our towns and villages today. So we have an obvious question, well at least it's an obvious question to me. Was that all a one-off? Now I think probably there are two answers, yes and no. Yes, it was a kind of one-off. The supernatural arrival of the promised Holy Spirit and the birth of the Christian church was an historic one-off event. So what happened in Jerusalem, partly mirrored then in Samaria, and again when we enter Gentile territory, all recorded in Acts, was to some degree one-off. Now, of course, we would be very foolish to suggest that God, God cannot ever again intervene in small ways or in big ways, however and whenever he wishes. But we should not probably expect these particular amazing events in Acts to become usual and normal. So if the first answer is this a one-off, the first answer is yes. Um, there is, <laughs> and I say this quite quickly, there is also the answer no because we don't simply read this as irrelevant, but just something which was extraordinary that time and then we can close the Bible and not need to look at it again. Quite the reverse, because in these few chapters here, and in particularly in this passage here, there are key lessons. And there were lessons for the whole church in every generation. And they're as relevant for us today and certainly they were then. So I'm just going to spell them out. The first lesson is to be united. Let me read 4 verse 23. On their release, because they had been in prison briefly, Peter and John the apostles went back to their own people and reported all that the chief priests and elders had said to them. And when they had heard this, they raised their voices together in prayer to God. 
And the unity is very striking. As soon as Peter and John were released, they reported back to the rest of the Christian community. The leadership made sure they were not remote from the rest. And the rest were not standing apart from their leaders. Good unity. And when they prayed, there was this natural and remarkable unity. It says they raised their voice. They didn't just pray, but they raised their voices together. Or as one version used to say, they raised their voices as one. Unity in these chapters is spelt out everywhere. And in the next few verses, it says all the believers were one in heart and mind. Now, probably when we look into the early church, just as in any other church, um, there were problems, there were imperfections. And certainly the early church in Acts had their differences, some of them in chapter 5 and then again in chapter 6. There were differences and disagreements and there were arguments. But any divisions were noted and tackled. And this is a crucial reminder for us today. Sometimes division is in the area. It always has been at different stages in the church's history. And it's worth remembering that the Christianity of the early church flourished, partly it seems, because it was united. But there are other lessons. Number two is to be God-centered. Now, it's not a great surprise, this lesson, but, but it's so obvious when we read through this prayer here. Let me read part of it. When they heard this, they raised their voices together in prayer to God. Sovereign Lord, they said, you made the heavens and the earth and the sea and everything in them. The prayer centers on God. Not just that he's present, but he was creator. And this is an extreme, if you like, but healthy and right view of God, that he was sovereign. He is above all and always will be. Sometimes the church can sound and feel not human focused enough. That is a tendency. We sometimes call it spiritualizing everything. When actually we should be more aware of the human human realities, human need, human complexity, and human responsibilities. And if you follow Jesus through his ministry and you read through the Gospels, you will see that Jesus in his ministry was always down to earth and had a great human connection with everybody. But although sometimes the church can sound and feel not human focused enough, it's also possible at other times we're in danger of not being God focused enough. Os Guinness warned us about this in his book, God in the Dark. And uh, so I just read a little bit of what he said. He said, if you believe in God, yet at the same time have a picture of God that is less than he is. Our faith is bound to suffer. What is a must for our faith personally is also a must for the Christian faith generally. We are to be thoroughly God-centered. A lot of people are off on holidays, or perhaps you are fortunate enough to have something. And even if it's not just going off on holiday, you might go out and you might climb a mountain, or you might go to the sea and look out over the sea. And it's, it's a completely different experience from being at home. And that's a good thing for us. Holidays provide the chance to take a wider perspective on life, to see beyond our own garden or our our own office computer, whatever it is. 
but also to look beyond our own local church and its future, to wonder about the future impact of Christianity. Let me read on a little bit because they, uh, that's not the end of the prayer. They pick up something that came in the Old Testament in verse 25. Sovereign Lord, you spoke by the Holy Spirit through the mouth of your servant, our father David. Why do the nations rage and the peoples plot in vain? The kings of the earth rise up and the rulers band together or take counsel together against the Lord and against his anointed one. Now, I'm not going to say more about the anointed one. But when we look at this as a whole and we look back into the Old Testament and we see the Old Testament brought bang on here into the life of the early church and their understanding of God, it makes us realize that we cannot make any impression on the world as it is unless we believe and call on God. The kings of the earth rise up and the rulers take counsel together. When we look at the happenings in Acts, the first few chapters, only God and his son Jesus Christ can take on the strength of the prevailing apathy, sometimes outright opposition. Only God can take on those powers. A purely human church will peter out and get nowhere. So that is lesson from the early church number two. And then lastly, lesson number three, be bold. We don't have a list of prayer requests here. Let me just go on to say what it does say. When you look at verse 28, they did what those... Um, uh, what your power uh, and will had decided beforehand should happen, those leaders. Now, Lord, consider their threats and enable your servants to speak your word with great boldness. Stretch out your hand to heal and perform signs and wonders through the name of your holy servant, Jesus. There aren't a whole list of prayer requests here. In fact, it's regarding us and something we have to pick up from this. There is only one. And that is to be bold. Perhaps it's just me, but I don't find boldness in speaking and acknowledging Jesus comes as naturally as I wish it would. But frankly, we don't have a choice. Even six years ago, the Guardian perception on disappearing Christianity, as they called it, disappearing Christianity in this country, raised the question, has it gone? Has it gone forever? Now the Guardian hopes not. And it gives various reasons why it feels it's important for Christianity to stay. But whatever paper we read, the figures suggest decline. And in people's minds, that's very much the case. There seems to be a disappearance from the great majority these days. So what is required? Well, it's the same requirement as a situation back in Acts of the Apostles. We need boldness. And if I could just unpack that briefly. First of all, it should be boldness with graciousness. Shouting our wares without engaging properly with individuals is never going to work. Matthew Side, you might uh, read him sometimes in the newspaper or you hear him on Radio 4. Matthew Side is a journalist who writes for the Times and is a presenter on radio. Um, a few years back, I saw an article he wrote about his family life. And Matthew said, my father is unusual in being converted from Islam to Christianity. His Christian beliefs are fervent and will never change. No matter how often he debates religion with his middle son, that's Matthew, and his daughter, both of us atheists. He encourages, he said about his father, he encourages anyone 
who will listen to put their faith in Christ. But he doesn't feel the need to in, in, uh, impose his opinions. And Matthew said, there is gentleness alongside his implacability. Boldness with conviction, but also with gentleness and graciousness. And the other side of that is courage, not timidity. When Paul was writing to Timothy in the New Testament, he realized that his young successor was prone to being timid. Paul's need for Timothy to hear these words may well resonate with us when he said, do not be ashamed about the testimony about our Lord. Sometimes I can find it tempting always to be diplomatic rather than to be bold. But looking back at the early church, I know that what is called for as much now as then is boldness with graciousness and courage rather than timidity. Uh, thank you very much, Roger. I now call upon uh, Sylvia to lead us in prayer. <clears throat>